welcome to the Everyday Miracles podcast, where real life stories of hope and inspiration are shared. Every day, miracles are happening all around us, yet we rarely hear anything about them. Why is that? I'm Julie Hedenborg, and I've committed my time and energy to bring these stories to you, including some of my own personal experiences. My hope is that you'll be impacted the same way that I was. Join me in my journey to inspire change in a world that so desperately needs it. Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Julie with Everyday Miracles Podcast. I am your host and I have a beautiful guest today out of Arizona. The city she's from is, I've never heard of, it's called Surprise, Arizona. I love that. And it's, I guess it's about 30 minutes outside of Phoenix. Um, But her name is Connie Barfield and her testimony involves a miracle of resurrection. Uh, Yes, says that in the Bible, these things will still happen with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I am thrilled for Connie to be able to share her story. We've been meaning to do this for a while now, and we're finally connected to do it. So Connie, welcome. Hey, thank you. Why don't you take us back to that day? I think you said it was the Super Bowl. Yes. Super Bowl. Um, so February 3rd, 2019, so just over a year ago, um, it was Super Bowl Sunday. We normally are with neighbors next door at a big party, um, but our youngest son had just moved out of the house about three weeks prior, mm-hmm. and he decided to stop by and visit. So we stayed home and decided we would go next door after halftime. And my husband had made a comment in the morning um, that his back was hurting, his lower back. He had just very brief. It wasn't anything intense. Um, he had taken some back a leave or something, I don't know, for his back. Um, and he had tried stretching it out, um, laying on a towel and stuff. But for the most part, he was totally normal. Mm-hmm. And later in the day, around 3.30, he had made a comment that he took a Tom's because his stomach was upset. Outside of that, there was nothing that I saw, felt, noticed different about him. Um, And so anyways, we were watching the Super Bowl, halftime show started, and we have dogs. One of them snores extremely loud. Um, And so halftime show had just started, Adam Levine had just started singing, and I heard the dog snoring. And I was laughing and I turned in the chair to look at my husband and, and be like, do you hear Levi, which is our dog? And realized that it was not my dog snoring. There was something going on with my husband. He just had this weird look on his face. His hand was up towards his ear and his tongue was sort of sticking out, but his eyes were wide. And I was like, what are you doing? And I was laughing. Um, and then he um, didn't respond. He just kept making these weird, heavy breathing sounds. I can't even explain it. Um, And so I stood and I was like, what are you doing? And we had a dog um, a few years back that had passed, but she used to have seizures. And the only thing I could think of with the sound he was making reminded me of the way that she sounded during her seizures. He wasn't seizing, but I was like, what are you doing? And then all of a sudden things started kicking in inside me. Something's not okay. And um, I grabbed the phone to call 911. And at the same time he stood and he like clenched his fist and his eyes got wide and he just stared at me like just really weird. And I sat him back down while I was on the phone with 911 to get um, responders there. I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was, but I definitely knew something was not right. And, um, that started, I couldn't even tell you how long of just pure chaos in the house of everybody rushing in and trying to save him and, um, and CPR and just all of the things, um, that starts happening in an instant and everybody knows their stuff. So, um, anyways, I knew something was bad. I uh, started calling people to say pray and, um, I don't know what's happening, but pray. And I was terrified, actually, something deep inside me, I could see from all the looks on everybody's faces, nobody will say anything, but they just have that look of like pity or I'm so sorry, like, you know that it's bad. But I didn't know what it was. I never dreamt it was what had actually happened. 
to him. Um, and these are the paramedics you're talking about? Well, so, um, no, the paramedics didn't really, we didn't really have a whole lot of contact with each other because they were so intensely working on him. It was more the police officers. And then also because it was Super Bowl, um, we had all these neighbors. I mean, it literally, once I screamed, help me, when I ushered my dogs out back, my neighbors were climbing over the fence because they were at a party next door. Mm -hmm. People were coming around their front. Like I live in an awesome neighborhood and they just flooded the house. One of them being um, um, an aunt of my neighbor in the medical field, they did not perform CPR, but they did scoop his mouth, clear his airways yeah. and uh, whatever. Luckily I didn't see what she scooped out, but I heard it was pretty gross. Um, and um, I could just see it on their face that they knew that it was something terrible. They knew that they had, Reed had gone pulseless um, here at the house and they just weren't going to tell me. And so I was reading everybody's face. Um, and so anyways, they worked on him a long time here. Um, they asked me medical questions. And of course, in chaos, you go blank. Mm -hmm. It's so weird what your brain thinks of. I literally thought like, I don't, who am I going to watch football with? Like if he goes, if I lose him, who am I watching football with? And like, there's just weird things. And I don't know, your brain just goes to weird places in, in grief or in chaos. But um, I call his doctor because I'm, we're super lucky that our personal primary care doctors are also really good friends. Mm -hmm. And so I called our doctor and said, something happened with Reed. I don't know what. Um, they're rushing him up to the hospital and they were asking me stuff about his medical and I can't remember. And he had just had his yearly physical a couple months earlier. And so he says, you know what? I'm out getting gas. Um, so I'm already out of the house. Tell me what hospital I'll meet you up there. And, um, and so his primary care doctor actually was at the hospital prior to me and was in there. So what I've been told and from the medical records was they performed CPR here on, at, on him at our house for, I don't even know how long they had to shock him and transport to the hospital. And then they, he coded again in the hospital and they had to perform CPR again for a long time there. Um, so in total, critical care time spent was 50 minutes. Wow. All the way around. So he went 45 minutes that, they're, that they have in medical records um, with no oxygen. Oh my gosh. Which there's no reason someone should be alive. Just to clarify, mm -hmm. brain death starts within minutes of no yes, oxygen. Three to seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, anyways, so at the hospital, um, I had, because of the history in my life of other stuff, I knew that there was that special small room that if it's a fatality where you're going to be taken, if somebody doesn't survive. And I had told my son, don't let me go alone. If anybody tries to take me there, don't let me go alone. Um, and, um, we literally in the ER just consumed this hallway. I mean, the fact that they let us stay there and with all of the people that started showing up is just, um, and again, like I said, our primary care doctor was there. He was in there when they did CPR on Reed and, and all that other stuff. Um, and so what I learned was that he had a massive heart attack. Uh, he had what they called the widow maker. Mm -hmm. um, there's less than 1% survival, I've been told of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's um, what the first responders told us, um, the chief that we had talked to is, is it's the perfect storm and you don't really get a whole lot of notice. So like the backache and the upset stomach was something going on, but it's not enough to be like something is really severe happening to get to a hospital where with Typical heart attacks of the simpler kind, I guess, isn't not to minimize a heart attack of any kind, but you typically will get a lot longer of a warning. People have time to get to the hospital um, and the survival rate is a lot higher. So um, they said he had the widow maker. And so the fact that they worked on him as long as they did here in my home um, without ceasing and the fact that they've worked on him again um, at the hospital as long as they did just has to be one of those um, just divine interventions of God just 
giving energy and, and um, desire and all of that thing, all of the things to keep on going. And what the um, fire chief had told us was, is my husband was 43 at the time of the heart attack. And they said, with somebody that young, we don't want to lose them. Not that we ever want to lose a patient, but they will work harder with a younger person. That being said, that they don't work that long. And that's just the honest answer. Um, and I've had people say, oh, that's sad. Do you think other people's lives would have been saved if people worked harder? And I'm like, no, I, I don't think that at all. I think, I think that Reed's just a special story in the sense of all of the things work together perfectly for them to keep going. It's not normal. And it would actually be very um, hurtful, I think, to a family to keep working on somebody that's not able to be saved and all of the things that come with the ramifications of that, you know? And so anyways, um, so that started, his massive heart attack started the next 34 days of an adventure for us um, that was, um, they rushed him in for surgery once they got him stable enough and they put three stents in his heart. Um, and then they put him in a, um, a ther therapeutic vest that every 30 minutes will freeze and then heats up, freeze. And it's just the main organs because they're trying to preserve organs. Mm -hmm. um, we made it through the first night. However, it was evening when he had the heart attack. But so even still made it through the first night. He was on life support and um, all of that stuff hooked up to massive amounts of IVs. Like it was just crazy. And um, I was pretty hopeful because he made it through the first night and um, not understanding all of the technical stuff that they say. And I really think that God protected me from hearing certain things as well. Mm -hmm. um, they took him in for a second surgery just a few hours later um, and it was for an impella. And an impella is a machine that helps take pressure off the heart. So it takes every other beat just to give the heart a break. Um, and so one of the greatest compliments I've ever, the greatest, not one of, the greatest compliment I've ever been given was when my husband went in for his first surgery and we, I'm abundantly blessed with people, abundantly blessed. Um, and so there was tons of people there, but I had to be alone and in worship. And somebody had come to the hospital to see me while we were waiting. And I didn't find this out until this Christmas, this Christmas that just passed. So almost a year later. And she said, there was a bunch of us that came to see you, but we didn't want to disturb you. And I felt horrible that these people would come and that I didn't remember them being there. And she said, no, it was fine. Um, we didn't want to disturb you. You were in worship. And my sister actually was able to somehow snap a very blurry picture of me alone in worship in this waiting room. And that was what I did. And part of it was obviously that I was just praying for my husband to survive. And the other part of it was knowing I am not going to be able to draw the next breath and get through drawing the next breath. If you don't give it to me, God, like surround me now. I just knew I couldn't, it was so much. And just because of other things that I've gone through in life and, and other losses, I knew second by second, what was going to sustain me. But it really is one of the greatest things I've ever been told um, because in my worst moment, I knew what, where I drew breath. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thankful that I, I, I don't just speak it, but that I live it. So um, the second surgery, um, the doctor came out to call us and call me back. And I had um, stood up terrified because he said, Mrs. Barfield. And so I turned to look at like everybody like, oh gosh. And he said, they can come back with you. And I was like, oh, well, that's good news, right? Like, so maybe we're going back to see him. And um, he took us into a small room and everybody was standing and my son and I were sitting and the doctor grabbed my hands and said, Mrs. Barfield, I'm so sorry. We have done everything we can. And he is not going to recover. He is actually already gone. And I said, what? And they said, he's still on life support. 
they said, but his heart is not responding. It's dead. The impella, it's just falling flat as it pumps up, it falls flat. Um, and my son, he's 23 now, but he was 22 at the time. I heard this sound come out of him, um, this moan that I've never, I can't even forget it, but I've never heard anything like it. And he kind of pulled his knees up into his chest. And I remember turning and looking and thinking, I should comfort my kid. Um, and I don't have the ability. And I was just at the doctor like, this isn't, we were talking about camping. Like my husband, we were sitting at the counter planning a camping trip with our best friends. And now you're telling me he's gone. And I said, I asked a question and he said, well, he's still on life support. And so, um, then I started begging him to take my heart, um, give my husband my heart. And he was the doctor being very gracious and explaining that doesn't work. And I told my son goodbye because my son's like, what are you doing? And I said, you're smart and you're strong and you're talented. You'll be fine. But the world needs my husband. The world needs Reed. And um, the doctor informed me they won't do it. And I knew that what it meant. Like, I know if I give up my heart, I'm no longer alive. Like, I knew what I was in grief. I knew what I was saying. And then he said, it's not just his heart. He's in complete organ failure everything is just gone. So I said, take one of my kidneys. Like, you know, you just, you're begging, please. Like, this is not, this is not happening. Um, and part of your brain goes through, okay, you're hearing it and you're processing and just grief. And then the other part of it is like, nope, mm -mm, this is not real. And, um, I tried to explain it to people. Um, something so deep inside me, like, and I'm just a person, so I don't know how wide or deep we are, but we're, I'm talking, it felt deep, miles deep in my spirit. I was like, this isn't, he's not going like, this is not happening. And not in a denial. Like I just knew or believed something that nobody else did. And I was actually getting frustrated and people got frustrated at me, but I was like, what is wrong with you guys? Because they were accepting it. And I was like, we aren't supposed to accept this right now where they're going to speak death, I'm going to speak life. And so I said to his doctor, is he, is he already gone? Like, are we going back there? And he said, well, technically he's still on life support. We're going to leave him on life support because you need to call everybody in so that they can say their goodbyes. And he said, and what we're going to do is this evening, we'll slowly start turning down machines and by morning, he'll no longer be with us. And I said, well, I will not give permission to pull the plug on my husband. He said, I won't ask you to. And we went through this whole thing. And he's like, um, in fact, I remember my mom saying, no, can't we still pray for a miracle? And the doctor said, the time for a miracle was yesterday. Yeah. And um, anyways, they took us into another waiting room from there to wait because they said they were going to clean my husband up and bring him back into his room so that everybody could come in and it's ICU. So you can only have two people at a time in the room, but they set it up in a different way. It's like they bring in what's called a grieving cart and they bring in more chairs. So that way people can come in and spend their time. And, um, I literally was going back and forth as more people would show up to say their goodbyes to him and offer condolences to me. The more I would just get emotional like this. What is, I was so mad that everybody was believing it. But at the same time, it's logical. Like when somebody's not going to survive, you know, you've got to go through that process. Mm -hmm. Something in me was different. Um, and then um, and later that night at like 6.30 that evening, he lifted a leg or kicked his leg out while he's still in heavy sedation and on life support. And, and they explained to me it was the brainstem dying. It's not response to requests. Like they go through this whole thing and, um, I had pastors that came up and they were like talking to me about release, you know, surrendering my husband, making sure I was letting go. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and I had to battle this whole thing of, um, if I let go and get a no, you know, but if I hold tightly, maybe I'm helping save him somehow. Like you just, you go through these weird processes of things. Um, and then a pastor, luckily that loves me enough to put me in my place gently in the midst of grief said, but you need to be obedient. And if the final outcome and answer is still God's and still going to be the same, make sure that you're in the right place. And so he luckily reminded me who I am. And I did. And I, I told God, you're, you sit on the throne. And as long as there's breath in his body, 
even if it's artificial from a machine, you're not done in this situation. So I trust and believe that you have the final say. Um, and I beg you to give me a yes. Like I beg you to let me keep him. And, um, anyways, um, he just, it's funny because God, I feel like he was showing off in a way, but not in an arrogant way. Um, he would let doom and gloom be spoken by these special, like specialists, you know, that are just brilliant minded. They'd say, this can't happen. And this is why. And God would be like, well, <laughs> yes, it can, <laughs> but only with, like, it's not even one of those where it came in close of, is this God or is it medicine? Like God really said, here I am. And so anyways, crazy enough, my husband um, woke up at 10 o'clock at night that night. So February 4th, eyes wide. And he was very emotional and crying and um, he would follow me with his eyes and and he was trying to talk to us about feeling pain. We thought he was trying to say he had pain in his chest, you know, CPR and surgeries and stuff. So we're like, yeah, yeah. But he was trying to draw our attention to his arm and he actually had an infiltrated IV and we didn't know it. And he was feeling the pain. Um, I have to interrupt you for a second. This is a man communicating with you that they have just told you is brain dead, his organs have all shut down, his heart is hardly beating. and just so I'm clear, you're telling me now he's trying to tell you he's having pain in his arm. Mm -hmm. And he was communicating because he's, he's intubated. So he's got everything hooked up to him. So all he can do with communication is he, we would do the blinks, right? Were the doctors like blown away? Were they changing their minds about his? So, well, he had one doctor, his, so his primary care doctor on the floor came in once that happened at 10 PM. And literally they would not leave him alone. It was four o'clock in the morning that they just kept asking questions and stuff. And so now we go into the morning of February 5th and the cardiologist, which is the doctor that sat me down, held my hands and said, I'm so sorry, who did his stents and his surgeries. He gets the report from the floor doctor and his nurse and all these things. And he's still like, hmm. So he comes in and evaluates Reed and I had a few people in the room with me at that time. Um, and, and, and he was just feeling bad. And so he kept telling me stuff because he's like, this is just, it's not possible. Um, and so he started telling me stuff about, you have to understand he went without oxygen for so long. His brain is like paper mache. And if you add it to water, it's going to disintegrate because he went without oxygen for 50 minutes. Your brain, your brain, it's not, could it possibly, it's a no, it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so as he's telling me that I laid hands on Reed's head and I just started praying and, and just speaking as I was hearing the negative, I would speak the positive and remind God what his scripture says and his truth. And, and he has the final say. And I was just praying, Lord, I just pray that you would just heal his brain and, and put it back the way that you designed it to be. And, um, and then he'd say, and he was without, you know, his heart's not responding to the impella. This is a machine. And I remember laying hands on Reed's chest and just praying and, and speaking healing over him. And um, the doctor got like just frustrated. And I can remember looking at him and saying, I'm not, I'm not trying to contradict you and come against you. I'm not. Your brains and your education and your knowledge and my faith can do a beautiful dance together. I'm not trying to combat you like, and argue with you because I hear you. And I know that people are thinking I don't hear right now because I keep speaking life. Every time they would speak death, I spoke life. And, and it's not because I've just been in this world so long I know to do that. It was something so deep inside of me prompting me. When I look back at the stuff that I said and did, I go, how did I know to do that? Or why would I do that? because it was the Holy Spirit working through me. It wasn't necessarily me. It was just, I was born with a big mouth and he knew I would do it. So <laughs> he was like, let's go. Um, and so I remember February 5th, the doctor just being like really frustrated, but not frustrated at me, frustrated that he couldn't help me, um, that he wasn't getting through to me. And I remember I turned to the people in my room frustrated as well to be like, help me help him. And as I turned, 
there was a double rainbow directly outside of Reed's hospital room window, like right there. And I just started laughing and weeping. And I turned to the doctor and I said, listen, this is what you don't understand. I serve a God who is faithful and he keeps his promises and he just placed one outside of my husband's window. My husband is going to have complete healing and restoration of his body. I just know this. And he just looked at me and turned and walked out of the room. And I was snapping pictures. We were all snapping pictures. And if I didn't fully believe it and know it prior to that, that my husband would live, it was game on after that point. I didn't know how long it was going to take. And I didn't know where all we were going to go, but I knew after I saw the rainbows that my husband was surviving. It was just that simple for me. Mm -hmm. And um, that just started a whirlwind of a process. Um, they miraculously had a bed open up um, at um, a university hospital where the doctor, the, heart, the cardiologist that he had, the heart doctors, he brought heart transplants to the state of Arizona. Brilliant minded. Um, and he happened to be my husband's doctor and he had a team of 13 people. So they flew him February 6th um, to the next hospital where we, and they, and he, the doctor told me, he said, your husband's as sick as it gets. Um, we, it does not look good. We don't know what's going to happen, but as long as he wants to fight, we're going to fight with him. And, um, and so that literally started 34 days of crazy stuff. Um, it was, you know, another time my husband, while he was there, um, all of a sudden had um, AFib. He went to AFib and, and they had to do all kinds of stuff. And they ended up doing the ablation surgery on him just to help. Um, he had rapid response calls done on him two times. He had an unsupervised fall out of the bed. Um, but I remember the day that they were like, we kept hearing this noise and, um, I was like, what is this sound? It was this weird vibration. And, and the pulmonologist comes in and she says, your husband is trying to outbreathe his vent. He's breathing harder and faster than this can even happen. And she's like, we keep changing his peeps yeah. and all this stuff. And uh, she's like, he's, he's a fighter. And um, there was something in me also that the first day, as his team of 13 people walked in, um, and I've clearly never been in this situation before, but I said, I asked all of these specialists, have you guys ever had a, um, um, a long-term loved one in, in ICU, spouse or a child? And nobody had. And I said, so then you only know what it is to walk in the door, but you don't know what it is to receive you guys. And it's very intimidating. And, um, and so his doctor said, well, let us introduce you then. Cause they're all talking as if I'm not really there. And, and there's just a body in a bed. And so I was like, I need to tell you something. And so I paused everybody. And I said, this is my husband, Reedy Barfield. He's a retired, um, army ranger, you know, blah, blah, blah. I've been 12 years. And I just started going through this whole thing. He loves me fiercely. We dance. He dances with me when no music plays. He's got kids that he adores. He's a brilliant mind, mechanical engineer. And I would just start telling them the stuff. So as every person would come in, I would make sure you need to understand this isn't a body in a bed. This is the love of my life. And this is who he is so that you get to meet him and treat him differently. Right. And so the doctor was like, thank you for doing that. And then they all introduced me and there was just something so different over me. Um, but it was scary. Uh, it was constant everything's constantly changing and it was always bad news followed by a surprise good news and in all of it i never once stopped believing god i also tell people sometimes i miss living in the hospital i miss the hospital days because i've never felt closer and it was i was surrounded constantly with worship people would send me worship songs and i was able to just stay in worship and i would sing worship with reed um, while he was in his sleep, we call it, um, and, and do worship with him and pray over him and all that stuff. And I can remember one day I was praying over him and um, I thought it was just he and I in the hospital and I could hear shuffling behind me and I turned and it was the housekeeper. But she had paused when she heard me praying over him and she just started praying in the spirit as well. Um, and I would tell all these doctors and people that they would come in, um, 
you know, we've got your back. There's a whole team praying, not just for him, but praying for you. You are divinely appointed. I trust you with my husband's care and we have you. And most people would just weep. And I literally, this is not like, I don't live at a hospital. These aren't things that I normally do, but there was something so amazing that just came over me, through me and in me that I was able to just lean into with everything I had and just speak and speak whatever God was placing on me to speak to the people around um, and, and just live in a faith that is so great. I've always known that I had faith. I did not know how deep. Um, and it's the only thing I can think of is, you know, as you're raised in a church, you hear all the cliche sayings of different things and spiritual warfare and things like that. I have never lived it wholeheartedly until this to fully understand it. And I've explained it to people. It felt like a literal tug of war because it was a constant battle. Like it wasn't easy. Every single day there was something new where Satan was just trying to steal, steal his life, steal from me um, and, and steal the testimony of what the whole thing was going to be. And it was every single day. And I would just reach out to everybody and say, I am begging you. We need to invade heaven, invade heaven with me, intercede for my husband, um, because there is something at work here. And, and again, I didn't know how long it was going to take, but I knew that he would survive. But it was a battle. It was a battle for 34 days. And then some, even after he got home, um, because he had healing, he still had to walk through. Um, because he had the infiltrated IV, it caused nerve damage to his arm. He had paralysis in his arm. He had um, nerve damage done to his foot from a massive hematoma that was from the first two surgeries. And um, he had so much was going on with him. He was on 24 hour dialysis, um, constant. And um, <laughs> there was just so much, so much constantly happening where they were like, this is not good. This is failing. This is happening. Blood transfusions, plasma transfusions. I can remember we were trying to get his therapeutic level for him to be able to get the line put in for the IV for the um, dialysis. And you have a certain window. Mm -hmm. And I can remember them rushing up the plasma and blood and mostly with the plasma, like you can't just like run it under hot water to heat it up to get it into somebody. It has to body temperature warm. And I can remember the one nurse standing at the IV squeezing with everything she had, trying to get it to go through. And she had another assistant in there and I, and we had, because he had three baths and we we're like rubbing them on our bodies, trying to heat them with our body heat so that we could hurry and get it in there with them so that transport could take them because you have these small windows of things mm -hmm. and it happened. It happened, you know, and it would just keep happening. And um, now we're home and, and he's alive. And it was, even after when he was released from the hospital, his kidney function was at 24. It's not a percent, it's a number. Mm -hmm. And so they said people with severe kidney damage from kidney failure, like Reed had, the best he could ever hope for is probably around 50 to 55, 60 would be the max. Average people that don't have kidney damage are in the 90s, um, 80s to 90s, you know, especially females because we've probably had a UTI at some point or whatever. But like the kidneys are like the brain. It will always show a scar. And um, so this is after he's released from the hospital and the kidney doctor says, let's do some tests and see. But remember, 60 is going to be the best. And you were 24 at release. And so the first time they tested him, he was already at like 56. Wow. So he said, well, you know, this is, you're still going to need to see a kidney doctor the rest of your life. So we're going to do another test on you in three months and blah, 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 and just see where you're at. And so um, they did another test on him where they have to just check everything. And his kidneys were at 103. What? And my husband goes, I was going for extra points on that one. Like, <laughs> And so his doctor, the kidney doctor was like, I don't, I don't even know what to say. And he said, um, best of luck to you. And you'll never have to see me again. <gasps> and so he was released from the kidney doctor. The neurologist 
um, you know, going without oxygen that long, they have all these different things, MRIs and CAT scans and stuff that they do later because they need to see what the damage is going to be because there's going to be long-term effects and memory loss probably and, you know, just all these things. And um, there's nothing. His memory is totally fine. The only part of his memory that he does not have is from the day of the heart attack until a month later. So he lost a whole month while he was in the hospital. And, and what they've explained to me is, first of all, the brain is a very smart and powerful tool and it knows when to like, not shut off, but shut down in, in what it's going to let you remember. It's a protective thing, mm -hmm. but also he was on serious narcotics because of all of the things that happened to his body. And he was in the coma for 10 days. And so they call it ICU delirium. He had it severe. And the withdrawals from the medicine, he would just lay in bed and violently shake his head in the hospital room. And so he actually wore a bald spot off on his head, gave himself a bad sore. Um, so he doesn't have one month memory, <laughs> but all of it he's got. Um, he has not lost any of it. Um, he um, walks, talks, drives, all of the things just fine. And, um, and yeah, he's... He's good. They are just shocked. So, okay. First of all, not having a memory of being in the ICU in that 30 days is totally normal because if he was ventilated, you know, they're probably giving him something to sedate him. So, oh yeah. I mean, this is, this is absolutely crazy. You know, I have seen as a nurse in the ICU, I've seen patients that get into this cascade where, you know, they have an event, maybe it's cardiac or, um, otherwise, but then all they go into multi-system organ failure. And it's like your body starts to go into just total shutdown. Mm -hmm. And for him to make this turnaround, I mean, you had mentioned at one point, um, there was a moment, I know your faith was so strong, but there was one moment you talked about yesterday about surrender. Can you talk a little bit about that? In 1994, I had lost my oldest child. Um, she was two and a half and she had and she passed. And so I've already at once walked through a deep pain where I know that you don't always get a yes when you beg God for a yes. Mm -hmm. And so the pastors knowing me and knowing my past and also knowing that I'm faced with my husband, they're saying he's not going to survive. We, we just got the, this is February 4th. So spin backwards. Um, he's not going to survive. And the, the one pastor, he was saying to me, because he could tell just my personality is also control. And, and he was like, have you surrendered him? And I was like, yes, to a point and no. And so he was actually getting on my nerves because he kept saying, you have to be obedient. So I turned to the female pastor who's known me forever. And he was with me not physically, but during that season in life when I lost my daughter. And so I turned to her like to plead for help, like get him off my back. And he was doing it in a very gentle way. Yeah. Um, as far as, you know, if you're going to ask God for help and pray for his life to be saved, make sure you're fully giving it, not holding on, you know? And, and I was looking at her and I'm like, but I've had a no before and I'm just crying. And, and how he is, he's my favorite place and my best friend. And if I let him go and he gives me a no, God gives me a no, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, um, you know, my pastor says, um, will the outcome be different if you surrender or not? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, who has the final say? And I said, well, obviously God has the final say in what happens in this. God's going to decide. I don't, the doctors have the knowledge and the skill, um, but they don't get the final say. God gets the final say. And um, he said, if the outcome's going to be that no matter what, God has the final say, don't you want to be obedient? Don't you want to be able to be obedient in what you've done with it, where it's like, I gave him to you, God, and, and I trust you. And, and so I remember at one point I had said, like, I know that God sits on the throne and I will still serve him. And I looked up at the ceiling and I said, but we are going to fight over this. Like, don't take him. And, um, but yes. If I want to wholeheartedly beg God for my husband's life and say, I know that you move mountains. Mm -hmm. I know that you can do anything and everything that you decide. 
then I'm going to fully surrender my husband to and say, whatever you choose, it is well. It's going to hurt. But I, I love and trust you that much. And I said, you're right. I, I got to do it. And so I cried. And I remember just praying with them and going through the whole thing. But I did. I had to let him go. If I wanted to get him, I had to let him go. And um, what's funny is I really think that God was already doing stuff, but I think he was really waiting on me as well in the sense of, come on, girl, like, are you going to do it? And um, because after that, it was just a constant showing off of stuff. I mean, it, it really was. He really just showed off. But it, it, I had to come to this place of fully surrendering before I also fully believed what he was going to give me. And then it was later after I fully surrendered that he showed me the double rainbow. And, and I think he knows me well enough because he created me that he knew once I saw that, like I said, it was game on. Yeah. So, and it was just, um, a constant, constant, amazing grace. Like I've never felt closer, like a heavy blanket is what I've tried to explain to people. It just, even though I was alone or fully surrounded by people, the presence of the Holy Spirit and everything that was constantly happening in the room felt like a heavy blanket, but not a burden heavy blanket. One of those just wrap you in comfort and safety heavy blankets. Yeah. And it was um, beautiful all the time. Beautiful, scary. My knees quivered a lot. There was a lot of stuff where I was like, when does it end? God, please like just give it a break. Um, because I knew I was being stretched as far as I could possibly go. And as I thought, this is it, like I can't go any further. God would take me a little bit more. But then when he would let it release, he would release it with such um, an excitement and beauty. I can remember the one day that one of the doctors walked in and was like, well, we're taking him off of this and we're taking him off of that. And, and um, the February 8th was when they removed the impella from him. And I said, why are we taking this out? And he said, because his heart is beating stronger and harder than the machine can even do for him. And I was like, what? And when the doctors would say, um, you know, they dance around the words, they don't want to say miracle. And they're like, you know, like, this is impressive. And this is, you know, just all these different words. And I remember one day when I finally got the first doctor to say miracle, I was like, yeah, buddy. <laughs> and there you go. I told you the whole time he was already dead. So they had to be kind of shocked and, you know, in awe. Yeah, and yeah. Can you share too, like when you, you went through all of this time, what it was like to walk out of there and how the staff reacted? So, well, we had in total, we had three locations that we stayed in. So the first was a hospital right here next to the house. Um, we were there from when it happened February 3rd until the evening of February 6th, they flew him out to the, to the next hospital. And I've got to say, Julie, this is the craziest part where I didn't even tell you this yet. So back in 1994, my daughter had fallen in a pool and um, was air evac'd to a hospital. At the time, Phoenix Children's Hospital was part of this um, other hospital. It didn't, the Children's Hospital didn't have its own facility. Mm -hmm. And um, I can remember that they rushed me to that hospital to be with her. And unfortunately, that's how I knew about the small room, like don't let me go into that room alone because unfortunately I was taken there when my daughter passed. It was the same hospital where my husband survived. So the hospital that my husband was flown to, yeah, is the hospital that my daughter died at. And what's funny is um, all of these years, so in 94 was when she passed, anytime I'd be on the freeway and I'd see the hospital, I'd always get sad and I point and say, that's Christy's hospital. My daughter's name is Christy. That's Christy's hospital. That's where she died. Now we drive by the hospital all the time, whenever we're going to the airport or whatever. And I'm like, there's Reed's hospital. It's where Reed lived. It's just so rad. But nonetheless, it was a full circle thing that God walked me through with having to go every single day. Once I started sleeping at home at night, every single day, the road that I would have to take to turn into the hospital parking lot before that I would pass and it had um, concrete barriers now blocking it but I would have to pass the emergency exit or entrance ramp that they drove me up the day of my daughter's situation and I would have to literally look at it and face it and deal with it but let me tell you it was a whole 
thing in me to understand that all of these years, 20 something years earlier, God started a process in me of who I am and what I am truly, truly made of, which is in of him and in him of so many things. It's what sustained me. And it's also, I've had to lean into him in a deep way after my daughter's death, because I believe in heaven. I believe in eternity and I know where she is. And so I've always lived a life of one day when I stand in judgment and, and you get through the first thing of, did you repent? I know I'm good on that one. Cause I, I, you know, but when you get to the second part where God says, what did you do with Jesus? I've always wanted to answer that well, because if we know who each other is on the other side, I've always known she's there. And if I want to see my kid again. And so luckily he started this in me in 94, um, this real thing of having faith, not just in all of the fun times and good times in Christ, but in the horrible muck and the mire, like really, truly with every ounce of your being, who is Christ in you? Yeah. And I've had to walk it and learn it and live it and go through other things as well. I've had other hurt, hurts and heartache that has happened since her, but nothing like that to the extreme until my husband. And then the fact that it was at the same hospital. And what I love is I left that hospital the first time in 94 broken with the world's greatest pain you can ever imagine because a parent is not supposed to outlive their child and especially two and a half year old and all that other stuff. And all of those years later, I walked out of there with my husband who everybody said, it's not going to happen. He can't survive this. He just can't. And, um, Luckily, God built something in me, instilled something in me, and all of those years later that I could just grab onto and say, but, but God, and um, I walked out of the same hospital this time with a victory, so it's a really, yeah. That is awesome, and didn't you say the nurses were, like, applauding, like? Oh, yes, at the first hospital, when we left the first one, because they didn't think he was, I mean, that was where they were like, this is no way. <clears throat> so it's totally like the most cheesiest lifetime movie ever for real. But anyway, so <laughs> I want to share. I love it. as they, um, as, as everything started improving after the rainbow and, and all of a sudden this Banner University hospital, all of a sudden had a bed available or no, a doctor that was willing to say, this does not look good, but I'll try if he can make it, I'll try. And so um, and then it was, but now we have to pray for a bed. Okay. So that's the next thing we're praying for a bed. And so anyways, February 6th, we got approval that a doctor was willing to even try. We got a bed available and all this other stuff. And we got a flight crew that was going to do it. So everybody shows up and they're getting him all ready and doing the things and doing the things. And, um, it's time for his flight crew is wheeling him out. Right. And it, the hospital, where we first were, they're called pods for each floor, like each section. So it's kind of a circular thing. So there was tons of staff and nurses and stuff like that that was not part of Reed's care, but we were a lot of people. I literally am abundantly blessed with a tribe. Um, and, and we invaded that floor. Um, and for the three days we were there and they were gracious and let us, um, but anyways, as more stuff would come out and they'd say, he can't, he won't, blah, blah, blah. And we would just continue to pray and believe. And they heard the worship music going and all of that other stuff. Anyways, they're wheeling them out. And it was seriously cheesy where there's applauds and, or applauds. And um, a doctor said, when he recovers, will you please bring him back here to meet all of us? So that we can meet him and one of the nurses was just crying this male nurse and and he was he had his hands out as in like if he was worshiping and he said thank you for living your faith out loud thank you for letting us be a witness and a part of this and i was like yeah like let's go it was just super rad like i i i don't know i don't want to ever go back in the sense of i can tell you my legs were like jello every single day i mean just that and that heat that would come over you the stress and fear and anxiety and stuff like that. But at the same time, the just awesomeness of God and what he'll let happen and show you and do. And I mean, it was just really fun too. Like really, for lack of a better word, just really rad, just really rad. 
It's and, absolutely crazy what you went through. Yeah. And for him to be doing so well, there's no medical reason. No, there's nothing. It's there's absolutely, absolutely nothing. unreal. The same doctor that held my hands to say, I'm sorry, Mrs. Barkle, there's nothing else we can do. He would not leave. He's the same one that was like, his brain is going to be like paper mache, blah, blah, blah. He was the same one that got frustrated and walked out on February 5th. Would not leave Reed's bedside all of February 6th because he kept improving so much. And so as they're getting ready to, the flight crew is getting ready to take him. He said to me, Mrs. Barfield, I will be your husband's primary care cardiologist when he recovers. I cannot wait to meet him as oh. he was leaving. Even he knew. So Reed, the very first time in person after he's released that he went for his very first appointment to the doctor, to the cardiologist, he said he was kind of like the creepy uncle, right? <laughs> so we're in, everybody's excited. But his cardiologist was just staring at him the whole time with this massive grin on his face and he kept touching him. <laughs> and he was like, how are you? How's it going? And so Reed goes, it was a little awkward, like the way he smiled nonstop at me. But um, anyways, he loves him. And in, in fact, with what's happening in our world today, we had just seen him a week ago for Reed's um, one year follow up. And um, they had done his uh, stress test and all of that stuff, right? And, and the new EKG or whatever, because they have to have a new baseline because Reed does have stents. Yeah. And the first thing out of this doctor's mouth, so remember a year ago, he said, I'm so sorry, there's nothing. His heart is dead. Um, comes in and says, well, congratulations, sir. Your heart is strong and it is completely normal. You would not know this happened to you a year ago. And so we laughed about it because it's funny to us now. And I don't know what his faith is, um, but I know that he's forever changed by what he watched and witnessed. And I don't know if I'll know it in my time or in my experience with him, what happened with him, but I know that God got him. I know that God got him. So if he was not a believer, there's something happening and that seed was planted and it's for God to tend and water. Um, and if he was a believer, he has a greater faith now. I can guarantee it. But I asked him if, you know, with what's happening with the world with coronavirus, is there any precautions I have to worry about with this man? Because, you know, like, is he at greater risk? And he said, nope, nothing. You've got nothing to worry about. And, and so we went through this whole thing. And so I was like, okay, you know, like I don't have any extra fears. And he said, no, it's the same thing with any colder virus. You've got to be careful. Like mm -hmm. if you're not feeling well, stay home, stay away from people, wash your hands often, blah, blah, blah. Don't high five or shake hands right now. But he's like, no. And then he looked at me and he's like, you've already been through the scariest thing. That was a year ago. Yeah. Coronavirus got nothing on this. So I was like, okay. So yeah, he's, he's one of those, he doesn't see a neurologist anymore. He doesn't see a kidney doctor anymore. He sees nobody, but once a year, he has to see a cardiologist. And then he's got his primary care doctor that he sees regularly once a year as well. Outside of that, um, he hit his one year anniversary. So he was released from certain meds. He'll be on baby aspirin for the rest of his life, you know, just cause that happens. So, you know, I wanted you to talk about the surrender part. My pastor had, he's been on fire, especially now we're online ministry only. And, and she had, pastor? uh, Stephen Furtick that interesting? <laughs> know before you looked, you, you looked me up, but I actually go to Elevation Church. Um, and he said something that was really powerful in the sermon today. Um, he said, faith is not a lever that we get what we want. Right. It's a lens. It's a perspective, you know, and I think so many times I wanted you to talk about the surrender part because I feel like, you know, I wish I could speak in the way he did, but it's not about, I rebuke you devil. I, you know, I'm commanded to get my way. It's not about that. But I think that's so important when you actually do surrender to God, God is God and we're not, and he has his plan. He has his way. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's what we want. It's usually not on our time frame that we want, but I, I felt like that was important for you to share that piece. Um, I thought that was really powerful today. Yeah, there was a lot of, um, I mean, me, the way that as a human, we romanticize things. I had it planned in my head. I didn't realize I was trying to manipulate God, but I kept telling God my thoughts on wouldn't it be rad if you, if you healed Reed today and got, he got to go home on the one week anniversary of the heart attack or 
you know, that would just speak to people, Lord, you know, like, and I kept thinking all these things where I didn't realize that I was trying to tell God how to do his job, but I was just like, this would be awesome. And, and, and all I can say is when we get out of our own way and when we finally go, okay, like we have, we're human. So we just have this much knowledge and creativity as well. Let me just say. And when we finally like really just say, I can't anymore unless you, and we totally let it go. He goes, well, guess what? Like you have this much, I've got this much. And the way that he creates it and, and dreams the things to go is so much greater, yes. so much greater than what we can even imagine. And I kept thinking, oh, this would be so cool. God, if you let him go home at a week in and instead, um, God let him go home right before our anniversary, our wedding anniversary. And so he got to be home with me for our anniversary. And like, there was just so much more special things, you know, like when we do surrender wholeheartedly and just wherever it's going to go. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference in, this is what I've tried to tell people. There is such a difference in our head knowledge of what we know and then our spirit. And we are supposed to tap into that. We are supposed to utilize it. It's supposed to be first not last. Our head says, oh, I should pray or I should go before God with this. But our spirit is fully like, and I tell people when you're going to go and worship, I listen to worship all day long as background music mm -hmm. all the time. It's just what I do. I work at my desk. So I've got music playing. And then daily though, especially with what's happening in the world, I have got to be in word and worship even greater and I'm like, there is something when you go into worship, like you're literally going intentional. God, I go before you. I need to be with you and surrender to you. And it's something deep in the gut. And it's, you get low almost, right? You go on to your knee or sometimes you're on your face on the floor. Yeah. But that's different than a standing, washing dishes and you got worship music in the background. There's a different kind of surrender that happens in it. And I had to live in that constantly. Um, at the hospital of sometimes it was just daily that I had to surrender. And sometimes it was hourly where I have to like reel it back in and be like, God, you have the final say. And whenever I'm stepping in your lane, remind me of it and gently push me back over because every time I would look at him instead, mm -hmm. and I would just seriously go. So I can't even explain the worship. Um, that I would get into stuff happened, stuff happened. I mean, God, no matter if I was getting in my own way or not read life sustained, but every time I would finally be like, okay, I hear you. I see you. I know what I'm doing and be like here and fully surrender. Big things happen. It was like when he would show off the most. Mm -hmm. And, um, like I told you yesterday, I can remember one time Reed was in, I think he was in his ablation surgery or, um, dialysis. I can't remember, but I remember I walked out of the hospital. I just had to breathe and I left and I was on the street, um, 12th street. And I was looking at the hospital and at the time there, um, my friends would just send me worship songs like crazy. So raise a hallelujah, um, um, do it again, things like that. Um, and I would just go outside and just be in worship. And you know, there, this is a huge university hospital. There are people surrounding me and I did not care. And I would be out there weeping, just screaming essentially worship songs because there's something primal that happens when you're in that kind of place and just from the pit of your stomach. And I would just be begging God with worship and reminding him as I'm reminding myself who he is mm -hmm. and what, and what his word says and, and all that stuff. And, and just going through this thing. And I remember at one point I turned to look at this wing of the hospital where Reed's room was to pray. And, um, I was marching literally up and down the street. Like <laughs> I can only imagine what people thought of me and actually don't care. I just hope it impacted them somehow. But, um, <laughs> I turned to look at this wing and um, in my mind's eye, I was able to see from this ground all the way up to the depth of the heavens, just the surrounding of people holding hands, not angels, people just surrounding, just covered. The whole thing was engulfed with it. And my counselor says it's called, uh, or he said, it makes you think of when God removes the veil, pulls back the veil to let you see in like a spiritual. And I can still see it today of just, him letting me know, like, 
it wasn't me on my own going before God. There was an, a, a responsibility that was mine and mine alone for sure. Um, but the church, the big C church, when we do what we're called to do, um, he let me see something and it was just this beautiful sight of we literally invaded heaven. And I told people, God's up to something. I don't think Reed's a one and done. I don't think this is something special. I think he does this all the time. Mm -hmm. But we get so caught up in life. And, and all of our activities and our things and our electronics and all this stuff, we don't stop anymore and give God our attention and our time. Mm -hmm. And, and if we would just slow down and start our days with him and be like, okay, God, you've got my first five and then I got to go. Like, but instead I felt so lucky that I was allowed to go through that. I felt so lucky that he put that on my life, that that was what, like, what a gift I don't know why outside of, I know that I've got a mouth. So he just knew that I would use it. Um, but like, I don't know why he picked me, but I am so grateful. And so it's, it's one of those, I no longer want to tip you some of my time, Lord. You get all of me and everything else gets the rest. Like, and that's where I have to be every day. And we choose this place of surrender. And if we choose this place daily of surrender and going to him, as our provider of all things, I really think there's more stories just like this out there. I think there's more that he wants to do. And I think he's up to something. This is a move and he just like, breathe it, you know, just breathe it over the valley, over the world. If we let him, he wants to, Yeah. we don't let it go. And if we would just let go, like, let go, get, let God, how generic of a cliche thing is that? But that's true. Mm -hmm. We let go and let God, he does so much more. Yeah. And, and he shows us so much more. Yes, he does. And I love that. I love that you shared that part. I do think this is a move of God. Um, I'm, I couldn't be more excited to host a miracle podcast right now. Cause I really feel like they're coming. So yeah, yeah. You know, uh, there's one other thing that you said, you felt like he's calling you to do something after you've experienced all of this. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, just really quick. Um, because now I have to be accountable to my own stuff, huh? Um, <laughs> So when Reed was hospitalized, after I started sleeping at home, so I lived 16 days at the hospital with him because I was not going to leave. Um, and then I finally started coming home. And my, the first day I woke up with just, it was actually starting the night before and God was just really placing something on me. And so I felt like I was supposed to reach out to people in the same in what I just said kind of to you, I felt like I was supposed to do, but I couldn't type. And when you're in chaos, like, um, the brain and the fingers don't work. So I couldn't type anything like a status on Facebook. So I did a Facebook live long story short, people loved them. Um, it touched people. It did stuff. To, it changed people's lives and people just kept reaching out to me. People I don't even know because people that know people that know people would share the story. And so I continued to do Facebook live because I, and I had told God, as long as you're giving me a platform here, I'll use it. And so I kept doing that even after Reed got out of the hospital, we would casually update, but I honestly, I didn't like him because a live video is very difficult to hold people's attention, but also you got to get stuff said and over with right away. But on Facebook live, people throw up emojis, they ask questions and I squirrel super easy. And so I'd be like, wait, what? And then I don't even know what the point was anymore. And I started feeling like it wasn't good. It wasn't getting a, a point out anymore because I didn't want it ever to be about me. And that's one of the things I've told God. As long as all glory points to you, like use this situation, use my words, put me in, in places I would never dream of going, Father, in front of crowds of people. Let me be brave. As long as I share this story, I will do it. If you think I have something to say, not if everybody else thinks I have something to say. And so um, people kept asking for more updates and I was really like just getting... I don't like it. I hate Facebook live. Like it's just not me. And I was really struggling and I was in the shower one day praying um, and telling God, like, I don't want to disappoint you. And I also felt like I owed them all these people who really rallied and, and came together um, and prayed and just interceded and all this stuff. Like I didn't want it to be like, okay, thanks for your prayers. Peace out. Like, you know, I, I, I wanted to be able to serve, but I didn't, it was just not, in that place anymore. My heart wasn't in it. So I was telling God, like, change me on this. And as I'm rinsing my hair, I can still see it uh, or feel it. Just all of a sudden podcasts got said. 
And I was like, so I'll just be totally honest. I've heard of podcasts. I'm more of a YouTube watcher. I've heard of podcasts. I've heard of churches that have podcasts or um, whatever. But in my ignorance, for lack of a better word, about podcasts, I thought only famous people, like you have to be an actor or whatever to have a podcast. And so I was like, God, what? Like, what podcast? And, and why would you give me a podcast? And um, I just got this sense of that that's where he was taking me next. And, um, and I was like, why? And then I just had this vision of a mouth open and this words coming out of it of, okay, I've got something to say. And so I was like, okay, there it goes. And so he started birthing this passion in me of a podcast. And, and I'm a person, um, I've been raised in the church. And so I use the number three as a confirmation. Um, in case I don't trust what I believe God's saying to me, where I will share something privately with people and, and just wait for their response. And, you know, cause two people will agree and it's either going to be like, um, no, you're too old for podcasts. You know, that's the younger crew or whatever. Um, or yes. And to this day, literally every time I've brought it up, every single person has said, yes, you'd be so good. People just love to listen to you and you've got so much to share. And even prior to Reed's situation, there's so much to share um, of what I've gone through and um, just a boldness that, um, of speaking. And so anyways, yes, that is the next move um, that God's taking me in is of a podcast. And so um, I'm not ready to launch that yet. I'm still getting into um, more episodes being recorded and edited, but that is definitely coming. Um, and it's so funny because that's how I found you. And it's, it's, it's funny that God started this um, heart healing in Reed and I with walking into Elevation Church. Um, and we've been drawn to it. First of all, my husband's from the Carolinas, um, but we were drawn to it. And then... Um, when he told me podcast that day in the shower and I was like, what? So I had to do my homework. And so I started getting onto my podcast and like trying to find podcasts. And I'm like, how do you even search like for normal people? <laughs> like where are normal people? Not, you know, wealthy, rich and famous who have a team that's putting this fabulous, you know, production together. So how do I do this? And what kind of words do you search and all this other stuff? And I didn't know. And, um, I was like, I don't even know what made me type in miracle, but I typed in miracle. And um, I'm going to be totally honest. There were people that I caught their podcast and I started listening to it. And it was just instantly one of those where I was like, nope, can't do this. Like the way they sound or, you know what I mean? Like there was just, it wasn't grabbing me. And um, all of a sudden I found yours and I was like, okay, well, let's see what this is about. And then I started listening and immediately was like, I don't even remember what episode it was that I listened to. And then I was like, I got to go all the way back. So I scrolled all the way through and started at the beginning. And I just sat here because I am blessed to work from home. I put my phone next to me and put it on the podcast and let it just go as I did my job. And I was just like, oh my gosh, and I just felt, and it's so weird because I'm not this person, but I just felt like I was supposed to like leave you a message. And so I sat here praying about it and I'm like, I didn't even really know why part of me was like, oh, I'm supposed to tell her about Reed because this is the you know theme of your podcast is miracles. But at the same time, there was just something else like drawn to you inside where I was like, I'm supposed to know her. And I didn't know why. <laughs> and so anyways, I prayed about it as I sent the message. I prayed and I just said, God, if this is, if I'm right and you want her and I to connect, then I just pray that you go before this and, and, and allow her to see it and that you set it up that she and I talk. And father, if this is not of you, and if this is me thinking instead of feeling, I pray that you would just block this. Don't allow her to see it. Da, 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 da. And, um, I don't even know why. I think I sent you a message on Facebook as well for the, just in case you don't see the review. Yeah. And I did the same thing. It was that same thing. I just said it out there like, Lord, if this is of you, um, and then I'm, if I'm honest, I don't get on Facebook messenger. I just don't do it. Yeah. Um, I'm not really on Facebook all that much anyways. And, um, I hadn't heard from you and, and I was like, okay, it's not, it wasn't what God wanted. And I remember just a couple of weeks ago sitting down and I looked at my messenger on my iPad, 
which I never ever do. And I saw your message and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> but what's so funny is God and I had just walked through something um, for two weeks prior to that, where I was in my feelings about my podcast and he was having to correct me and where I had gotten into his way and out of my lane. And, and so I wasn't supposed to see the message because he and I was still, we were going through our own thing about something else before he could bring me here because I've known. And so then when I found out yesterday that, cause I jokingly said to my husband, when I got your message, I was able to see your Facebook because you messaged me from your personal account. And I go, Charlotte, I said, Reed, she's in Charlotte. Um, I mean, wouldn't that just be so funny if she went to elevation? Like I was just laughing about it because I just feel like there has been something that God planted from there. And so then when I find out you're there, I'm like, this is just insane. This is insane. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I have no idea what it is with the church other than if that's where we started, like the healing started or what it is, but I've known that there was some kind of connection and I don't know when it all comes together, but I find it ironic in a godly way. Um, but that's your home church. Yeah. And that was where God allowed us to, um, we were plugged in, you know, until Reed's heart attack. After he got out of the hospital, we went back to my home church mm -hmm. because I felt like um, we needed to be in the physical with people, with what Reed was walking through. I just felt like, and me, oh my gosh, the, yeah. the anxiety and all of the things that happened to me in living past, you know, the day of, we just needed people that were physically there to be able to lay hands on us, to pray, to hug when we're weeping, you know, that kind of stuff. And so we are back at my home church where I've been since I was 11, but there is a definite connection always and forever for elevation. So I still watch on Sundays. So we attend Saturday night service for our church. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always jokingly said it's because I don't want to have to choose between God and football. Yeah. <laughs> Um, for when football starts, but um, the truth of it is on Sundays, that's, I still, sometimes I still log in to go live with Elevation, but um, I, I still have my, I got to just listen to his message and see what Burdick's up to. So yeah. can't get away from it. So I think it's funny that that's where you go. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's really cool. Well, I am so happy that we finally did connect. I'm, I guess, you know, I always say it's God's timing, the way things work out. I just trust it. Um, I do want to ask you one last thing. You know, going through all of this, I am going to post your podcast to um, the link to find you for people that want to listen, because I want to listen too. Um, but the message coming through all of this, if you had to, if you had to make it a concise message for people, what did you learn from going on through all this? Um, I was raised in the, in a younger world of, um, the faith that I was raised in back then was more the wrath of God. You know what I mean? Like righteous judgment type of thing. And the truth of it is there is, he's just, he just loves us. He just loves us. Um, and if people could get past religion and understand that he just wants relationship, if people could just um, feel the heart of those of us that follow and serve him and why, um, and, and I tell people all the time, me as a mom, I would never be watching my kids intently for them to mess up so that I could trip them. Be like, told you not to do that and trip them and make them land on their face. As much as we love, and this is what I kept praying over Reed in the hospital, and I say this all the time, as much as we love, he loves so much more. So much more. He loves you even greater than me, I'd say to Reed. Just you hang in there. He loves you so much more. And if we could just get past the rules and the regulations and the righteous judgment and wrath of it and understand that there is a father that loves us. He just loves us. Um, we would have a lot less conflict in our life. We would have a greater, stronger walk with him, I think. Um, because as humans, we think, oh man, I messed up. So now we have guilt and shame. And if you understood, um, 
conviction of the Holy Spirit, conviction that's of God is so gentle. And it's, it's not one of those where it's like, doggone it, you messed up. Yeah. Now what? It's one of those, oh, my love. I call them love notes from God, um, where it's just, he just gives you that sweet, I don't know how to say it, just something sweet in your spirit where it's like, oh man, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm sorry I did that. I'm, I'm sorry. And, and you just can fall back into them. And so I think the greatest lesson I learned from this is, because I've dealt with worthiness, worthiness issues my whole life, um, just because of things I've experienced. And if I just understood the way um, that he sees me, the way that he loves me, yeah. um, and how tightly he held me through that whole thing. And I think, oh my gosh, at the same time, he was working a miracle in this man's body, but he never let me go. Like never let me go. But he was working a miracle in this man's body. He was restoring and healing broken, dead pieces back to greater. And he held me so tightly. Like that's, people just need to know he loves us. He loves us. He's passionate about us. Mm -hmm. And so that's my greatest takeaway from it is he's, he's still moving. He still performs miracles. He is a living, breathing God still today. He's not a God of the Bible days. He's not history. He is still very current, but he loves us. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. It's been an honor. I'm, I'm so, so excited that I got to. Yes, and Reed is doing so well. I'm so happy. Yes, he's doing great. Well, I really appreciate you sharing. And I just want to say to everyone out there, thank you for listening. I know I was blessed. I'm sure you were too. Please share it. Um, if you have a miracle that you would like to share with me, reach out to me at everyday miracles podcast at gmail.com. I am on Facebook some, but I don't all, like you can see, I don't always get those messages right away. So make sure to email me or um, go through their submission page, but, um, thank you for listening and uh, God bless.